as we kind of transition now, uh, Jody, uh, who is going to be heading up our summer outreaches, today's our kickoff. Uh, they're going to be going into Men Around the Lake uh, Community Center. And uh, we want Jody to come with the team that's going to be going with her this morning. We're going to kind of commission them out. Uh, we're going to have prayer with them. I'm going to ask uh, for my board uh, to please join me up here as well uh, so that we can have prayer uh, with this team uh, as they go out into the, into the community of Men Around the Lake. And, and uh, let's pray for God's favor. Uh, we've, done, we've done our homework. Uh, we just a couple of quick testimonies behind this. Um, this year uh, was the first year that the Lord really opened up a door that we were able to get into the apartment complexes and pass out information. And so we have put out over 500 flyers about this event today. Uh, we we pray that there'll be at least a hundred. Uh, the community center doesn't hold that many, uh, and so we're going to pray that there'll be an abundance. Uh, and that uh, we're just going to let the light of Jesus Christ shine in that community. Uh, they're going to just touch lives in a practical way, just with uh, servant evangelism, and just connect and build relationships. Uh, and this is the start today, and you'll see the schedule uh, that we want to stay consistent with it, that we do it each month on a Sunday. And uh, so this team is going to go in. You may have a heart that you want to go into the community. You can see Jody uh, with the upcoming outreaches. But this event today begins at 1130 and is going to run until about 1230. And uh, so let's pray uh, this morning. If you feel like you want to come up and have prayer with this team as well, uh, please come up, stand behind them or in front of them, and uh, we're going to just agree uh, with the Lord. If you'd like to do that this morning, we want you to do it. We don't want you to be afraid. Don't worry. God's not going to strike you for praying, okay? <laughs> Actually, he encourages it. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. But let's pray for God to give favor to this team, amen, as they just love people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, today we are so thankful that we have an opportunity to be the light of Jesus Christ in a community that needs the gospel. Father, you've given us a heart and a passion 15 years ago for this community. Lord, that light still burns bright as we would be that Bible-believing church in a community that needs Jesus Christ. Lord, you've helped us to lay a foundation so many years ago. That foundation continues even today as Jody and this team of people that have a heart to serve a community with servant evangelism. God, I pray that you are going to strike relationships and build them up, God. Lord, that they are going to just love people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for favor, God. We pray as that soil has been tilled and prepared. God, the seed has been dropped in that community. We pray this morning that they will, in practical ways, touch people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for kids. We pray for families. Lord, we pray for that community. We pray for the city officials and the city leaders. We, we pray for those, God, that, Lord, you, that are, 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 uh, are serving in that community. Lord, you've given us an open door, God, and we pray that as we walk through that door, God, you will give favor. Let grace abound, God. Let grace abound this morning. And, Lord, we pray, God, that those doors, that when they're open, people will walk through those doors. So, Father, I pray as you have uh, equipped Jody and, and you've spoken to those that are going to serve this morning, God, we commission them in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, to go out and do the work as, a, as an extension satellite outreach, gospel, Bible-believing, living organism church, hallelujah, where the life of Jesus Christ will transform hearts and lives in this community. And, Lord, we honor you for those open doors. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hug their necks before they leave. Amen. High five them. Amen. And, and uh, let's, give the Lord a, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, we'll look forward to the upcoming weeks of hearing testimony uh, of what God has done and what God is doing. 
in, in this, uh, with these outreaches? Praise God. Amen. We're going to continue to worship the Lord this morning, and uh, we invite you to, to stand with us as we worship the Lord, and, and as our worship team will lead us into the presence and prepare our hearts uh, to receive the message that God has for us today. Amen? Let's trust the Lord this morning. He's going to do great things. Amen? Amen. Let's come with an expectancy. Amen? Amen? That God's going to do great things this morning. Praise the Lord.
think of this morning as we're praying for people around this altar today, that the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart this morning that it's only Christ that can heal and love and set the captive free this morning. It's only Him that can do that. And there were many requests this morning praying for God's healing in, in families' lives, and maybe you're here this morning, you yourself, or maybe family indirectly this morning, going through some things in life personally. Know that heaven's policy is whosoever. That's heaven's policy. Whosoever will believe or call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's God's extended hand of grace and mercy that we continue to pray in people's hearts and lives. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I am just, you know, as I think about this week and as I was preparing this message this week, I, I began to think about just God's extended hand of wonderful, wonderful mercy and grace. God's infinite wisdom. And I began to think about how blessed we are in life to serve a God who loves us unconditionally no matter what we go, are going through in life. He doesn't want our condition to stay the same. He wants us to change. But He loves us through that. Amen. And I began to think about 
what it truly means to, for us to live a blessed life. Because we have an incredible privilege and opportunity that some people don't have. And that's the privilege of having a loving relationship with a Heavenly Father with an unconditional love for His people. Amen. And it's the whosoever policy. It's Heaven's policy. That if we call on Him in that time of need, He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He will not forsake us. But He's there to love us through those moments. And I trust that you'll find peace through that. Because that's where true peace comes from. True peace comes from not our identity by the things linked up to this world, by our stature of our jobs and our lives and things of that nature, but it's who we are in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And aren't you thankful this morning that God's ways are above our ways? Amen. Man, that's just a wonderful thing. You could preach on that one all day. Praise God. If I could have the ushers will come forth and we want to continue our time of worship with taking up our morning time offerings. You know, the beautiful thing about that whosoever policy, though, is it tells us there in Matthew's Gospel that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, that if we will confess Him, before others, He'll acknowledge us before His Father. Amen? Amen? I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of salvation. It's the power to change life. And we have the power that Christ has given us to be an influence to those that are around us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Jerry, would you ask a blessing on our morning tithes and offerings today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, whether by hard copy, by cell phone, by computer, by whatever it may be, I want to encourage you to turn to the book of Colossians. Paul's letter to the church of Colossae this morning. And we want to look at this letter this morning. And I want to challenge you with a question in this message today of how I can experience living a blessed life. How many, maybe just this week, you experienced the hand of God, the blessing of God in your life this week? Amen. Praise God. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse number 3. I'll be reading from the New Century Version. It says, In our prayers for you, we always thank God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have heard about the faith you have in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people. You have this faith and love because of your hope, and what you hope for is kept safe for you. Look at number, uh, verse number 6 now with me. Verse number 6 this morning. It says this, that this was told to you that everywhere in the world that good news is bringing blessings and is growing. This has happened with you too since you heard the good news and understood the truth about the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask this morning, your word is already anointed. We pray, God, that the lessons we learn from this word today would be life-changing lessons. Lessons that would continue to move us forward in our faith. Lord, and I pray this morning, quicken our hearts, our spirits today, God, to hear what you would have us 
to hear through your word today. Help me to step aside and allow my words to be seasoned with salt that we would be challenged and encouraged through this word today. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. At the end of this message today, I'm going to pass out to you this morning a little bit of homework. Amen? There's only two people that want homework. We're going to give to you this morning, though, a copy of what I call the Next Steps Challenge in our walk. If we're, we need to be encouraged, we need to be challenged, we need to be strengthened, and we need to know that God's Word disciples us daily. Amen? That's how we grow, right? We grow through the Word. God speaking to us through His Word. How do I experience the blessed life? The answer to that question is important because the answer to that question will tell you maybe just where you may stand with the Lord and how important He may be to you in your life. This message isn't intended to beat you down in no certain way. It's meant to challenge you to soar to greater heights in your relationship with God. The world does a good enough job of beating us down all week. That's what the world does. It wants to beat you down. Right? That's how we stay encouraged and we grow in our faith is by being a student of God's Word. It's what it tells us to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed of the gospel, but rightly dividing the word of truth. How many times have we seen a person, maybe in athletics, not reach their potential? How many times have we seen students go through schooling never reaching their potential? Sometimes it can be a very sad sight to see, and people around them whisper about what a waste of talent or potential they see. I remember as a young student growing up in school and knowing that my only way of getting to college was going to be through an athletic scholarship by playing baseball, hoping that that would come to pass. And my dad, my parents at that time, decided we, we were in, I grew up in Lyndhurst, Ohio, and so I was going to go to a bigger school, a Division I school, and my parents thought I would have better success with my athletic talent at a smaller school because I could get noticed quicker. And the minute that we made the move, you know, as a young kid growing up playing golf and always being breaded into that with my parents, my grandfather was a professional golfer, and, and, and so I never had a chance to meet my grandfather. And so growing up, the potential of athletics was, because my dad was an athletic director in high school, and so I always had that breeded into me. But I was always told, too, that as a student, I had what they call today ADHD, you know, and, and, and told that I wasn't going to be able to go because academics, I wasn't the smartest cookie in the box. And so, so, through, so through that, my parents send, us to, send me to a smaller school, and all of a sudden, I'm all excited because I, I know I'm going to be on the golf team. I'm going to have a chance to make the golf team at a smaller school. Well, the minute I get to, the, to freshman orientation, they send a notice out to the family that we're sorry to inform you due to coaching and lack of students wanting to go out, we're canceling the golf program. There it goes, right out the window. All those years of practice wow. and talent. So I drop the clubs and picked up football. So I played football, basketball, and baseball. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, so, you know, with baseball thinking, okay, yeah, this was going to be my ticket. I wanted to get to school and, and do all this. And, and, uh, and I, my senior year, I had a fourth grade reading comprehension level in my senior year in high school. And I told that academically it'll just never happen, but sports-wise, it'll be okay. And that was pounded into me as a kid. You're never going to go. 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 
Can you imagine? Now reverse that role just a little bit. You know, as a pastor, you tell people, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. That's not what the Word of God tells us. The Word of God tells us, I can do all things through Christ. You know, but it was amazing, though. You know, after all the years of, of the things that I did by mixing my life into the things of this world and, and my, my life of where I, I, what I did and where I was and all that, it's amazing, though, when I surrendered my heart and life to Jesus Christ, got full of the Holy Spirit, it was all of a sudden like this, you know, started quoting, quoting Scripture, went through Bible college, gra gra graduating through school and things of that nature, and the Lord brings things to my remembrance. Because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. And all the years of you can't, you can't, you can't became kingdom-minded when it says I can, I can, I can. And see, so understand this morning, see, that's why I say that it's so important for us. We, 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 our jobs, our lives, everything is tied into the community and the things of this world. And so the world does a really good job at beating us down. And when we come into God's house, we need to hear the Word of God, but we also know that the Word of God challenges us. We also know that we serve a God that loves sinners, hates the sin, but loves people. And this message is a gospel of love, but it's a gospel of, 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 it's a gospel of challenge. It's a gospel that will encourage you. It's a gospel that will do all those things for you. But the one thing it won't do is beat you down. Right. Using the pulpit as a spiritual whipping post, as a soapbox. God help us today. So individually, we all have to decide how much we're going to let Jesus Christ be the Lord of our life. We all have to determine if we're going to totally give ourselves over to Him or we're just going to scratch the surface in our relationship. Is it okay to just say that, yeah, I go to church, but I'm really not connected to is you see, it's one thing to know him, K N O W, because if you know Jesus, K N O W, you know peace, K N O W. Know Jesus, N O, know peace, N O. There's a difference in those two words. So we can't just scratch the, our, the surface in our relationship. We, we're going to be a, if we're going to be a church that is happy with scratching the surface of what God can do, then what are we really doing? Or do we come with an expectancy every time we gather corporately? Is there an expectancy that God is, is going to do something in our hearts and our lives during the time of worship? My hope today is that we'll learn some things that will help challenge us and go deeper in our relationship with Christ. But this letter today with three major purposes in mind, those purposes are still very valid today when Paul wrote this letter to the Church of Colossae. One, to encourage us not to go back to our former way of life. Two, to direct the people's attention to Jesus and to get them fully trust and worship Him and fully recognize who He is as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the third thing is to emphasize the virtue of forgiveness and kindness. Today, we're going to look at just a couple of indicators that tell us if we're letting Jesus make that difference of having a blessed life. First thing this morning is the question, is Jesus the center of our faith? Is he the center of our faith? If you look at verse number four in the book of Colossians, it says this, because we have heard about the faith you have in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people. I love the way that this letter does start out, though. It starts with Paul in verse 2 saying that he's writing to the faithful brethren of Colossae. Then he moves to telling the readers that he's thankful for them, and he's always praying for them. Aren't you thankful that you know people in your life that are always praying for you? Amen? Amen? If it had not been... 
I remember that great old song that taught the guys at Teen Challenge. My mama prayed for me. She had me on her mind. She took the time and she prayed for me. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed for me. My Jesus prayed for me. It's a little catchy tune, isn't it? It's good stuff. Amen? But there was somebody that prayed for us. Somebody that prayed for us. Then he moves into what he's thankful for. He's thankful that he's heard of their faith in Christ. When you think about it, that's an impressive statement. The faith of the church at Colossae is so great that it's known all around. What a testimony. Amen? Amen. What a testimony. Notice, too, that their faith is in who? It's in Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's centered and based on Him. Their faith in Jesus made such an impact on the lives of those in the church that they gained a reputation for their faith. I wonder what people would say about the church as they walked around Colossae. I wonder what people might say about the subject, about the church of Victory Lane when it comes up. What are we known for? I've, I've, I've heard conversations of where people say, you got to come to this church. This church just loves people. We will do anything to help and encourage. And those are great stories. Those are great testimonies of what the love of Jesus Christ is all about. Amen? Amen. I'd rather know that than to know, don't go to that church because all that church does is gossip about this. They got clicks over here. They got clicks over there. God help us. And maybe some of us have been involved and seen those things through the life of our church life. But thank God today that we can walk around and tell, you know, that we, we're making a great impact this morning. You know, here's a team of people that are going out on Sunday morning into a community to give their time and their talents of stewardship just to say, we want to love you in a simple message. That's what the church should really be about. What are we known for? Is Jesus making a difference in our lives? Will we be known for our faith in Christ? The only way that Christ makes a difference in our life is if we have that undying faith for Him. He had it for us. Amen? He laid everything on the line for you and I. Amen? And all He wants us to do is corporately gather one time a week. Isn't there sweet, sweet fellowship when we gather corporately in his house? Yeah. Man, I love, so I told Mary this morning, I, you know, as we're sitting there and, you know, uh, and we're getting ready for church, the, the Sunday mornings that I really enjoy are the fact of knowing that, you know, we're, the Holy Spirit has really spoken to my heart about this word, about the message, and to know that we get to come and just get the love on people and have fellowship with people. That's, that's what I look forward to as I, I get together with you on Sunday mornings because, you know, during the week I may hear from some of you periodically because of prayer requests or things of that nature and things that you're going through. But to know that we come in sweet fellowship together corporately to serve the same God, amen? And Paul was thankful for the Church of Colossae because they had a nice building, he was not faithful because they sang a certain type of music or had a certain order of service. He was thankful for them because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen? Faith means in part to trust. So who do we trust? Whose hands do we really put our salvation and our trust in? Who do we turn to in times of trouble? Who do we give glory to when things are going well? If Jesus is the center of our faith, our life is going to be totally different. And I hope that our church is known for a church that loves people unconditionally but loves God more. That's how we'll win more people to Jesus. If we love people, but we love God more, we'll see more people come to faith in Christ. Amen? Hallelujah.
If Jesus is the center of our faith, our life is going to be different. That will never happen unless two things happen, though. Our faith has to be evident in our lives, and secondly, we have to be involved in the lives of other people that God puts in front of us so we can demonstrate our faith in action as Christ's hands extended to them. That's how the gospel works. We're not called to sit on our faith. We're not called to sit on the premises. We're called to stand on the promises. Amen? Amen. That's what God wants us to do. The second thing this morning is our love for one another evident. Do you know that I love you? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not necessarily looking for an answer. But do I know that you love me? Yeah. It's like a little kid at Christmas time. He goes and he looks and he thinks, is the biggest present under that tree? Come on, man. How many of us, when we were kids, we shook the pre I, I do it all the time. I do it today. We shake it to see what it is. We shake it. Every year, my wife and I, for the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, it's just a running thing that we do in our family is we buy each other socks. We know what we're getting. You know, that's, that's the given rule in the Bill household. Well, this year adding a family member to our house, she got some socks. Bella. And she opened her own gift. But we know what we're getting each other every year in that sense, but still it's the fun of knowing that it's a wrap thing. And my wife is so smart. She is so gifted, you know. I can't put anything past her, you know. And, uh, and that's, that's why she always tells me, that's why you married me. Um, and, and it was that fact that, you know, we think about that with those gifts. And, but is, is our faith necessarily demonstrated that way by giving gifts to one another? Sometimes we almost feel obligated if we get something, we've got to give something in return. Well, somebody might just want to be able to bless us and just give us something and not for us to have to do anything in return, right? Well, is, it, is our faith demonstrated in the same way? You know, Christ loved us unconditionally, but are we loving Him back unconditionally? Are we loving Him back those same ways? Are we, we saying, Lord, thank You, because You loved me unconditionally in this mess that I just created for myself. Your hand of sovereignty, Your hand of grace and mercy continues to be extended to me. Amen. Or... Do we do this? I can't believe that they did that. Do you believe that just happened? Do you believe that that took... Aren't we good at that sometimes? Guilty as charged, right, sometimes? Yep. And we got to watch. So is our love evident for one another? That's what he talks about here in that verse, in verse 4. Is he the center of our faith? The fact will manifest itself in how much we love our brothers and our sisters in Christ. We talk a lot about love in the past and we'll continue to do that through the future and history of this, of this word as God tarries. But it's an important issue and if we can't love the most unloving of us, then is Jesus making a difference in our life? Jesus loved Judas. I'm just saying, okay? He had plenty of reasons not to, but he did. So what becomes our excuse? How many of you have heard this? I would love that person if. Well, we're putting conditions then on it. That's not agape love. Then there's, sometimes you ever been around those people where they just like, You don't want to be around them? And then all, all of a sudden that starts into a conversation that doesn't show the love of Christ? We eliminate ourselves of taking us out of 
what it is to experience a blessed life for those things to happen. We cannot ask lost people to come in and love those we will not love. If Jesus is making a difference in our life, it'll show by how we're able to love one another. I remember as a kid growing up, my dad always told me, he said, you need an attitude adjustment. And I did. And sometimes as believers, we need attitude adjustments. We do. That's just the fact of life. My wife will be the first one to tell you if my attitude gets out of line, she'll say, you need to live what you preach, mister. But she has the freedom to tell me that because she's my wife. I'm her husband. And I look to her for that. If she can't speak into my life, who can? And so we have to, we have to understand that sometimes. But sometimes we have to, and God may put that most unlovable person in your life for a reason. And guess what? Sometimes it might even be a family member. It's happened to me. I don't wish to be on the outs with my sister. I don't. I hope that I can make a difference in her life. She needs to see the, and de and the demonstration of faith by me just loving her without her not knowing who Christ is yet. Just because she's my sister. It's somebody that Jesus died for. But sometimes our family can be the most unlovable people. It happens. Those people that are the closest with us. Now, come on, husbands. How many times has your wife given you the silent treatment? Okay. Just saying. Nobody's flipping up their hands automatically here. Okay. I, I remember... I, is our love for one another evident? I remember starting off in the ministry. I was one year... Mary and I were married for one year. I was working at Teen Challenge. We were living in the apartment up on the hill. I had a bad day with a couple of students that walked off the program and stuff. One guy told me he was going to sick the nation of Islam on me. And um, I get home, and uh, my wife is making dinner for me. And she says, hey, how was your day? And I said, really? You're going to ask me that question right now? Like that. And she pointed... And she said, get out of the house and go across to your office and sit in your office so you can talk to me like my husband. Way to go, honey. She did it. <sighs> yeah, Mary gets all the applause. You guys hear one side of the story? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, it's, think about it, though. How, how do we treat one another? How do we do it? Christ... We have to think about that. We can't ask sometimes those that we don't love, we're going to love them unconditionally if we can't love them. 1 John 2 tells us this in verses 9 through 11. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. We can't say how much we love Jesus all we want. We can't tell him how sold out we are and all we want. But if we don't love one another, they're just empty words. If Jesus is making a difference in our life, we will love one another unconditionally. Amen? Amen? The third thing is found in verse 5. Does our faith rest in your hope in heaven? You see, this world's not my home. Amen? Amen. Verse number 5 says, If you have this faith and love because of your hope, and what you hope for is kept safe for you in heaven, you learned about this hope when you heard the message about the truth 
the good news. And we find out there in that verse the why and how the Christians at Colossae had such great faith. Their hope was focused on what was laid out for them in heaven. If Jesus is making a difference in our life, we'll be able to realize there's a bigger picture. Amen? I have a home prepared where the saints abide. Just over in the glory land. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let it rain holy buckets. Amen? Amen. Man, I want to get home. I don't want to be here. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. That's what Keith Green said. And he was taken far too early. That's when they used to make music. But you will not get even or take vengeance on every injustice done to you. You can't do it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay it, saith the Lord. There's a bigger picture. Paul's thankful for their hope, faith, and hope are always tied together. Faith is based in hope. 1 Peter 1.4 says it like this. We've been born into a new life, which is an inheritance that we can't be destroyed or corrupted and can't fade away. That's the inheritance that's in heaven for you. Hallelujah. As believers, we have a very different perspective. It doesn't mean we've arrived or better than anybody. He's willing to forsake the present glory, comfort, and satisfaction of this present world for the future glory that is in Christ. In contrast to the buy now, pay here later attitude prevalent in this world, huh, the Christian is willing to pay now and receive it later. As believers, we don't live in a microwavable society in faith. Not instant gratification. Sometimes when we pray, that seed that's been sown, we have to wait for it to come to pass. Amen. Amen? What makes us willing to make such sacrifices? Well, hope based on faith. The future that holds something better than the present. And finally this morning is this. Is God's Word penetrating your life? And is it penetrating the lives of of others. Where did you get this hope, faith, and love? Well, we read it in verse 5. They heard the word of truth. They heard the gospel. They didn't get their faith, hope, and love from a cereal box because I believe they heard the word of God. Amen. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Constantly bearing fruit where the gospel seed is sown. Fruit grows. If the gospel has penetrated your life, your life will be fruitful for God. And that fruit production will never stop. No, not only will your lives produce fruit, but it will increase all the time as you grow and you mature. That's how we grow and mature. It's through God's Word. We produce more fruit from God when we stay connected to the vine. Amen? Amen? Amen. We are the branches. He is the vine. We don't need fancy programs to help us grow. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit and a living God and a connectedness by staying in God's Word through prayer, devotions, and worship to watch His church flourish. Part of the reason a church stops growing is because individuals within that church stop growing. If you don't get this in you daily, you will die. You can say you love God all you want. You can say that you're a Christian and you go to church. Let me help you with that statement. Going to church will not change you. Being the church will. That was so good, you missed it. I want you to hear it again. <laughs> Being the church will help you grow. That'll help you to stay connected to Christ. Just going to church does not change you. Any more than sitting in the garage makes you a car. Or being on the grill makes you a hamburger. Doesn't do it. Being the church makes the difference in your life. 
If you're not getting this in you, if the world is occupying your time to where you've got to schedule the time to get with God, you need to readjust your priority because you'll miss out on the blessed life. God's Word is so full of blessing and promises that what this world has to offer is only a cheap substitute for what God can really give us. Amen. And you'll miss out. Don't ever think for a moment that just going to church makes you a Christian. That is a lie from the devil. That is a lie. Going to church does not make you a Christian. I could walk into a Buddhist temple, doesn't make me a Buddhist. I could walk into a Mormon church, doesn't make me a Mormon. This makes you a believer. When you, be, when you are the church. When you stop doing church and become the church. That's how you have the blessed life. So this morning as we close, are you withering in the vine or are you feeding with the Word? If you're withering on the vine, then your life is not producing fruit. If you've been serving the Lord 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, praise God. Doesn't mean you've arrived. None of us have. We're in the constant learning stages of our life every day. Honey, can you help me? One per, we'll get one per family. So I want to give you some homework. I want to challenge you in your faith. Don't just take this home, stick it in your Bible, or do this. Don't do that. I, I said that because... Now you're accountable to it. If you do that, God knows you've done it. And he'll get you. No, I'm just kidding. How do you experience the blessed life? Here are some next steps challenges for you. I want to challenge you with something this week in your faith. Monday... I would love for you to be able to journal an area or areas where you may lack in faith, totally trust, and surrender that to God and know that He will provide for you. Now you may say, I don't have any area or areas that I lack in faith. Well, praise the Lord. You'll be preaching with me next Sunday. Because I have areas that I lack in. I'm the pastor! <laughs> Just, it's real. It's real. Tuesday, I want you to pray that the Lord would help you with that area and search His Word to see what He says about it. Wednesday, would love for you to send out a note or a phone call on that area, whether by email, Facebook message, maybe to a family. It's a society we're living in. Or someone in the church and have them agree with you in prayer about that area of faith. Thursday, randomly demonstrate by faith an act of kindness something you've never done before for somebody. Friday, plant the seed by faith by giving a personal invite to someone to come to church with you next Sunday. Watch and see how the Lord will bless you this week by stepping out in faith of this area you may not be comfortable with and see if God doesn't provide. You know what happens if five people bring, in this church, bring five people with them on an invitation? That increases the church by five, right? If those five invite another five, that increases the church to what? Come on. This is easy spiritual mathematics. It increases it by ten, right? If those ten invite another ten, it increases it by what? 20. And in one month, we'd have 20 new people in this church, possibly. Yeah. 
How are we activating our faith? Let me tell you a story as we close this morning before I close in prayer. About six months ago, I met a young man. And he gave his heart to the Lord. And he was attending a church in the area. Well, in his community, he got so excited about, the, about what had happened in his life, he started inviting people to church. Within one month, he had 25 of his people from his community in church. In one month. Tell me it can't be done. And I'll tell you, you're wrong. God can do anything that he wants to do. It's up for us to be the church and not just go to church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. Your word is not just something that we read and off a page that doesn't have life, but it's the life-giving agent to help us change internally and externally. I pray that we walk out of this service this morning, Lord, encouraged and challenged through this message. I pray that we would be that life-giving agent this week, whether it would be a family member or a friend. God, if you call us to reconcile relationships, God, help us to do that. I believe that you want all of us to experience the blessed life because it's what your word teaches us. So I pray this morning, God, that that would happen for us. That we would step out in faith and trust you. Lord, I pray that when we gather together next week, we would be that life-giving agent that you called us to be to know that we come with an expectancy ready to receive what it is that you have for us next week. And I pray that we would take application to this message today. And we give you thanks this morning. We give you honor. and We give you praise. And so, Lord, I ask now that you'd be with us as we depart this place. God, protect us. Keep us together our rising up, our lying down, bless our hands, whatever it is that finds to do that brings glory and honor to you this week. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.